The topic I picked tonight was one that I hoped would be interesting but also probably helpful for some of the more diagnostic dilemmas that you will have in practice. I worked in general practice for five years before I did my residency and I know that when I had a bleeding patient come in or an animal that went through surgery and then had unusual bleeding postoperatively, it would freak me out. It would be very difficult to try and think logically and work out sort of what was going on in my patient. Um, when I did my residency at the University of Minnesota, I did research into IMHA and hypercoagulability associated with that and all of a sudden found myself doing nothing but coagulation disorders. Um, and then I spent two years at Cornell University um, working in the comparative coagulation lab there and found out that it's actually a pretty straightforward process. Um, and hopefully tonight I can kind of go through some of the more common problems that you might see in practice um, and a fairly easy way of working through those problems as well. I'd like to also maybe touch on a few newer bits of information about coagulation that have come out over the past five or ten years or so, um, which I guess is new for me, um, so that I can try and keep this interesting for you. So what we're going to do is start off is talking about the traditional versus the modern coagulation cascade. Um, then we'll go through, through a few important hypocoagulable disorders, some hypercoagulable disorders, and then a, a little diagnostic algorithm to work through when you have your patient. Um, and treatment, of course, because that's what you will want to know what to do. Um, and then a couple of case studies if we have time. So basically, traditionally when we're in vet school, we're taught about coagulation being split into two fairly independent processes, your primary hemostasis, which was your platelet plug, and then secondary hemostasis. And it was a very neat way of learning about it. It helped you get your thought processes straight and remember what platelets do and what clotting factors do. It also helped um, that patients generally, if they had a defect in primary hemostasis, usually would present with a set of reasonably discrete clinical signs compared to those who had coagulation, um, clotting factor disorders. Um, however, it didn't really reflect very well what's going on in the body because it tended to make you think that these two processes were going on in isolation. We're also taught the traditional coagulation cascade, which was this nice sort of fairly simple Y-shaped cascade. You could just memorise the numbers. Um, the best thing about the traditional coagulation cascade is it makes it very simple to remember what's going on with your clotting tests that you run. So the APT tests the intrinsic pathway and the common pathway and the PT tests your extrinsic pathway. And so you knew if you had a defect in one but not the other um, that your problem lay within these side branches here. What it didn't really explain though was what happened, why would a dog with a factor eight deficiency bleed if all these other pathways were still intact? And why would a dog who only has a prolongation of um, PT from a factor seven deficiency um, be showing clinical signs of bleeding already when theoretically your intrinsic pathway should kick in. And so this kind of made it seem like it was an either or situation is when it really is more of a kind of everything happening at once. This is the everything happening at once. Um, much more ridiculous to learn. I'm sure none of us could ever have memorized this in vet school and would have ever been interested in doing it. And, um, but it does really nicely explain this kind of explosion that goes on when you have an endothelial disruption and coagulation is triggered. The really important thing to take away from this horribly messy diagram is these days they'd break coagulation up into an initiation phase, which is usually triggered by tissue factor exposure under the endothelial surface, and an amplification phase down the bottom here. And we have this has been to be a little symbol for um, exposed phospholipid surfaces um, present on platelets or um, on the endothelium. And these phospholipid surfaces I'm going to talk about a few times um, during my talk because it was an area of re research that I um, worked in. It's extremely important for clotting factors to have a negatively charged phospholipid to bind to. And without that negatively charged phospholipid surface, they really can't form the little molecules required for clotting. And I feel like that was something that was not really, at least something I picked up on in vet school anyway, um, that clotting really doesn't, really needs this phospholipid coming from the platelets to occur. 
The other way you can get this um, phospholipid surface is from development of, or production of what's called platelet-derived microparticles. And that's something that I hope will become more common terminology in the, over the next, I don't know, 10 years or so. And platelet-derived microparticles are essentially little membrane blebs that are sort of butted off activated platelets um, when a platelet is stimulated by tissue factor or a variety of other different stimulants, whether they're inflammatory mediators um, or uh, turbulence or it just damages the platelets themselves. These teeny tiny little baby platelets are extremely highly charged and they're really, really good at collecting coagulation factors on their surface. Very, very important in clotting. We're finding that they're very, very important in a lot of the hypercoagulable diseases like IMHA, sepsis, SERS, trauma, um, where we don't really know why these patients become hypercoagulable. Um, and also we've dis um, discovered some diseases where dogs aren't able to actually make these little microparticles. And because of that, they have a bleeding disorder that is completely impossible to define on any of the other coagulation tests that we have available. So you'd run every single other clotting test and the dog should not bleed based on those. But in reality, because of this very, very tiny ab um, abnormality in their plasma membrane, they bleed quite significantly after surgery. So just going back to this modern coagulation cascade, it can be simplified quite nicely down into a little initiation phase and then a propagation phase. And really the whole point of the initiation phase is to produce a very small amount of thrombin. And that trace amount of thrombin is then used to, um, to catalyze the production of, um, uh, to act of to what we refer to as a tenase complex, which will then activate um, the production of a th prothrombinase complex here. So these are the tenase complexes here. Again, the little clotting factors all stuck onto a membrane surface an intrinsic one and an extrinsic one, and a prothrombinase complex here. And in this amplification process, you then get a huge burst of thrombin production, which then leads to fibrin, which helps you with your um, clot formation. So that's the, the lecture over. Um, I won't try, I'll try to avoid any more didactic stuff at this point. We'll start going over some of the more common cases that you'd probably be seeing in practice. Just out of interest, how often are you seeing rodenticide toxicities in practice? Like once a week, once a month? every six months or so, every couple of months. They're, they're still really, really common. Um, it's probably one of my favorite bleeding disorders because it's the most treatable one. Um, and they're extremely common. They're kind of good cases to come in because you can look like a hero. So just a quick refresher as to how vitamin K antagonism works. Vitamin K is required for hepatic carboxylation of gamma carboxyglutamic acid residues on clotting factors. And these GLA residues are required for the clotting factor to bind to the endothelial surface. If they can't bind to the endothelial surface, they don't get activated properly. And so the clotting factors are still made, they still exist in circulation, they just can't stick onto the endothelium. And that's why they don't work very well in our patients. Um, the liver, of course, is um, where that hepatic, where that carboxylation occurs, um, and warfarin and brutifacum and all these other um, uh, rodenticides interfere with the hepatic reductase activity, and you get um, impaired carboxylation of these clotting factors. And you'll probably all remember that PT is prolonged prior to APTT because your factor seven has the shortest half-life, only about 12 to 24 hours of all the clotting proteins. So haemophilia is going to present very similarly to a, uh, to a vitamin K antagonism, but it's much, much, much more rare. And it's something you're going to see probably more in younger dogs and more likely coming up as a complication of surgery. Um, you go to neuter a you know, young, uh, large breed male dog, um, and he goes and blows up with a huge scrotal hematoma afterwards. You feel terrible until you realize afterwards the owner sort of says, you know what, he's had a few bruises and things in the past. Um, and he's a golden retriever. And eventually you'll work through your uh, diagnostic pathway and you'll discover that he ha probably has haemophilia A, which is a factor eight deficiency. We also see haemophilia B, which is a factor nine deficiency. Um, but there are lots of dog breeds that have various types of haemophilia. Um, they're still very, very rare in the grand scheme of things. You're not gonna see it very commonly, maybe I don't know, once every couple of years, um, but they do occur. Um, and the severity really 
is very much individualised. Some dogs will only bleed post-operatively and the rest of the time live a very normal life. Other dogs will present to you because of large muscle bleeds or joint bleeds, hematomas, um, and their quality of life can be quite significantly compromised depending on the amount of factor that they actually have circulating. In humans with haemophilia, they have replacement factor treatment. They go in and get um, synthetic um, clotting factor replacement or, or endo uh, exogenously produced clotting factor replacement and they can have relatively normal um, quality of life. We don't have anything like that for our patients, unfortunately, so it usually becomes a matter of keeping your dog quiet um, and giving plasma as needed whenever they have a bleeding problem. Haemophilia A is definitely the more severe um, out of the two forms. Um, and basically what's happening is that you're getting delayed factor 10 activation. You're just not getting as much thrombin produced because you can't form those 10 A's complexes. Um, and so you'll still get some clots, but they're weaker. They're not really stabilized properly with enough, th um, with enough fibrin. Liver disease is something we encounter every day um, here and um, probably in, in general practice as well. It's an extremely common problem for our patients. And liver pr disease really pr uh, provides us with a very significant clotting problem because a lot of the time we need to get biopsies from our patients. We need to work out what's going on in that liver and yet at the same time dogs with liver disease may have any number of different types of coagulation problems going on at the time. They may have deficiencies of their clotting factors, of fibrinogen. They may also have deficiencies of protein C and S and antithrombin. This these deficiencies here are going to make the patient more likely to bleed, um, and so certainly a risk of bleeding out from a liver aspirate, a liver biopsy or surgery. These deficiencies here, protein C and S are fibrinolytic proteins, and so an antithrombin is um, involved in inhibiting thrombin production. So these ones are actually going to make your patient a little bit more likely to throw a blood clot or have a PTE or something like that post-surgery. And then thrombopoietin is going to potentially lead, uh, a deficiency of thrombopoietin might lead you to have a patient who is um, thrombocytopenic. So your patient may do anything. It might bleed and throw a PTE at the same time <laughs> if you're really lucky. This factor down the bottom here, um, thrombin activable fibrinolysis inhibitor, TAFI for short, um, is also made by the liver and taffy is um, something I feel like I didn't really hear very much about in vet school and it's really involved in stabilizing the blood clots. Um, it's activated by thrombin of course by its name um, and patients who are deficient in taffy will form blood clots and then they'll have de delayed bleeding afterwards, they'll have enhanced fibrinolysis so you'll think everything is fine and they get a really nasty amount of bruising sort of 12 to 24 hours post-operatively. We'll see taffy deficiencies in a few different types of coagulation disorders, but um, liver, di um, liver disease is certainly one of them. So moving away from all of our clotting factors, thrombocytopenia is the other sort of side of the coin when it comes to bleeding disorders. Most important thing to remember with thrombocytopenia is there's almost more artifactual causes of thrombocytopenia than real causes. And so the very first thing you have to do when you have a patient who may be thrombocytopenic based on a CBC in, um, on an in-house machine is check a blood smear, look for clumps at the feathered edge, um, look for evidence of macro platelets, which you may see in Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. And these are platelets that are larger than normal, still produce an overall total amount of platelet tissue in the body, um, but a lower count in general. Um, and looking to see approximately how many platelets the dog has. Some of those in-house machines will really be completely off when it comes to platelet counts as, long as, as soon as they get below the reference range. It may read out you, you know, having 25 when you've actually got 5 or 50 and there's a fairly significant clinical difference there. One platelet on an oil immersion field is about 15,000 platelets um, total if you kind of average it over about 10 um, different fields. Other thing to remember is that sometimes platelets will be more sticky if they're collected into EDTA and they'll stick to the side of the tube so you'll still get um, artifactually low counts even on a machine, uh, a, a external lab count. Um, so sometimes if you're having a problem getting uh, accurate platelet counts, collecting a sample into a citrate tube will help as well. And I have to then hop on my soapbox for a second about collecting into citrate tubes. Um, if you can, 
use vacutainers to collect blood samples for any testing. So use vacutainers with a little adapter um, and a little butterfly to collect it. And that means that blood will hit the citrate straight away as soon as it gets into the tube and that'll prevent any um, uh, intrinsic um, or contact activation of that blood before it's collected into that tube. It's amazing how quickly those um, contact activation pathway can start. And so it's really best if you can collect it straight into a little pool of citrate at the bottom of the tube there. If you can't do it with a vacutainer, the other thing you can do is suck the citrate out of the tube into a syringe. So you've then got the right amount of blood, um, citrate in your syringe and draw directly into that syringe that's already pre-citrated. The other really important thing to do is remember that to use the right ratio of blood to citrate as well because all of these assays were very much affected by um, the ratio of blood to citrate in your tube as well. So off my soapbox, <laughs> won't mention it again. So the three main causes of thrombocytopenia in our patients um, are either going to be increased, increased destruction, increased consumption or decreased production. And generally the different causes show different clinical pictures. So our immune mediated thrombocytopenias usually present with really, really severely low platelet counts, less than 10,000. They're usually actively bleeding out of every orifice. Um, and it's one of those ones where it's a, it is a presumptive diagnosis. It's very difficult to prove that a patient has idiopathic immune mediated thrombocytopenia. Um, but typically they have a very clear clinical picture and the history and all the clinical signs usually um, point to that being the, the diagnosis. Of course, you're going to want to try to rule out things that could have triggered that immune mediated process. Um, but most of the time, if it's less than 10,000, that's usually what's going to be the cause. In Australia, you are blessed with a quarantine system that has so far present, uh, prevented tick-borne disease. Um, in most of the country, I'm not sure about up north, perhaps there's some crazy stuff up there. Um, so that shouldn't really be on the list for here. Um, and paraneoplastic will, um, causes will always cause increased destruction as well. If you're getting a platelet count that's probably around the 50,000 range, um, the first thing to remember is that that thrombocytopenia is not causing your patient to bleed. It's a symptom rather than a cause of the bleeding. And that's most likely going to be consumption from bleeding tumours, microangiopathies from uh, heartworm disease, DIC, um, splenic torsion or GDV, um, and IMHA as well, my favourite disease, um, would be another cause of having these kind of sort of consumptive uh, thrombocytopenias. Decreased production is probably the most rare cause of thrombocytopenia that we see. Um, most of the time it's going to be either immune mediated or drug um, induced where they'll be on phenobarbital or cytotoxic drugs or azathioprine or something like that um, and the bone marrow has been suppressed. Platelets only last for around um, one to two weeks or so so they will start dropping pretty quickly depending on the drug that you've used. So if your patient has a clinical picture that looks like primary hemostasis is affected but your platelet count is normal, then a platelet function issue is probably going to be um, what you're dealing with. And von Willebrand's deficiency is probably the most common one that we all um, see. It's certainly the most common breed-related um, coagulopathy that we see in our patients. Um, von Willebrand's factor, just as a reminder, is the little plasma glycoprotein that binds between the endothelium and the platelets and helps the platelets adhere. And once those platelets adhere to the endothelium, they then pop out their little receptors for the clotting factors to then bind to the platelets. So without von Willebrand's factor, again, we haven't got the clotting factors adhere to the endothelial surface and adhere to the platelets. Um, Von Willebrand's factor is stored in the endothelium in these little Weibel pallid bodies um, and also some of it circulates bound to factor 8 as well. So the breeds that we see with Von Willebrand's deficiency, Doberman's absolutely number one breed but we do see them in a few other large, breed uh, large, other large breeds. There are three types of Von Willebrand's disease. Num type 1 is by far and away the most common. Um, Type 2 is a tricky one in that they will actually have normal von Willebrand's levels on an antigen assay, um, but what they actually have is a disproportionate decrease in the large um, multimers because von Willebrand's factor comes in a variety of sizes. And so they'll still have little tiny versions of it, but none of the big ones. And so they actually have really severe bleeding because of it, but it'll present as normal on your initial assay. If you had a patient 
a German short hair, short hair or wire hair pointer with this a bleeding disorder, you probably would want to be thinking about this as a possibility. But it's really, really, really rare, so I wouldn't hold your breath waiting for a case. And type 3, um, I've never actually heard of a case personally, and that's where they have absolutely zero von Willebrand's factor. So a few other zebra cases, we do see some other thrombocytopathies in otter hounds, great Pyrenees, basset hounds, spitz dogs, cocker spaniels and collies. Um, and these are situations again where it presents with primary hemostatic defects, normal platelet counts and everything else looks normal. Your APTT, your PT are all normal but your patient is still bleeding. Of course in that situation you want to rule out an acquired defect first, so sepsis, uremia, hyperglobulinemia from multiple myeloma. Um, leptospirosis or lymphoma can all cause platelets to stop functioning normally um, and that would be much much more common than one of these breed related platelet function disorders. The one that I didn't mention at the top there was the German Shepherds and uh, German Shepherds have this syndrome called Scott syndrome that I mentioned just briefly and that's where they are unable to form platelet derived microparticles. It's a condition that's been well documented in humans and probably only documented in German Shepherds since about 2006. Um, not known if it is worldwide although it has been seen in various other countries and these dogs present with delayed bleeding after, uh, after surgery, sort of wound oozing. Um, also they'll present with epistaxis or toenail bleeds and things like that. Um, not massive, massive bleeds, um, but certainly enough to be annoying. Um, and they'll test pretty much normally on all other um, coagulation faction testing. Greyhounds, um, I'm not sure how many of you guys treat retired grace, uh, racing greyhounds, but um, those who do probably know that sometimes they can be a real bugger to spay um, because they often bleed quite a bit post-operatively. And they've been known to have an enhanced fibrinolysis where they form clots totally normally, but then they break those clots down very quickly afterwards. Um, and that's something that's been specifically uh, researched at Ohio State University, um, and they've come up with a treatment protocol for that as well. So this is something I have not had to deal with in the past 10 years, <laughs> and it's been a little bit of a shock to the system for me um, to actually have to see snake bite again back in Australia, because we've got some really nasty snakes here. Um, Snake bites in Australia can cause coagulation disorders for two different mechanisms, um, either a consumptive coagulopathy or an anticoagulant um, venom. More commonly, um, brown snakes, tiger snakes and taipan snakes have a procoagulant venom. And so their venom actually ha is homologous with these activated clotting factors and it induces a consumptive coagulopathy very, very, very quickly, uses up all the clotting factors almost straight away. You'll get prolonged APTT and PT. Um, importantly, you'll get a low fibrinogen, um, elevated D-dimers, thrombocytopenia, um, and you'll get a very rapid onset within hours of the bite, but resolution over 24 to 48 hours. In contrast, the red belly black snake venom is actually anticoagulant, and you may have a more rapid onset of bleeding with those um, snakes. So I think um, they kind of will come in already sort of bleeding in front of you. Those guys will have normal fibrinogen and normal D-dimers because they're not forming clots and breaking them down. They're just completely unable to clot anything. Um, they will be thrombocytopenic um, because of consumption for little platelets trying to stop any bleeding. Venom-induced consumptive coagulopathy is not um, specifically treated by the antivenom. By the time you get antivenom into your patient, um, all the clotting factors have been used up and the venom isn't gonna make any difference to the coagulopathy at that point. Um, so basically the only thing that you can do to treat that is give them plasma, replace the clotting factors that have already been used up um, and give the, give the body some time, 48 hours or so, to um, make new clotting factors. So I'm not going to spend as much time talking about hypercoagulable disorders because even though they are probably very, very common um, in our day-to-day -day practice, they're often not quite so clinically obvious to us. Um, we don't tend to have too many dogs walking in the door with PTEs or with thrombosis in legs. They, dogs don't fly long distances most of the time. Um, and so we don't tend to recognise hypercoagulability in our patients as often as we would see hypocoagulable disorders.
Back in vet school, we were taught about Virchow's triad, which is three elements um, that work together to make a patient hypercoagulable. So hypercoagulability, hemodynamic changes, which is like either stasis or turbulence of blood flow, and endothelial damage or dysfunction. We also have to remember in the body, some of the things that help prevent thrombosis are those checks and balances of antithrombin and an active fibrinolysis system. Um, Antithrombin is a really, really important protein. Um, we can measure it in our patients and in humans, it's been well documented that a level less than 60% is um, going to put you at risk of thrombosis. And if you have less than 30%, you're a critical risk of thrombosis. Low antithrombin is seen in liver disease, protein losing enteropathies or nephropathies, shunts, sepsis, DIC, congestive heart failure, trauma, cancer, IMHA, and surgery. Um, and in sepsis in humans, um, low antithrombin is associated with decreased survival. So this is <laughs> a necropsy picture from one of my IMHA patients from back in my residency. And just a, a very, very, very strong reminder that IMHA dogs are extremely procoagulant even after they leave the hospital. This dog had stabilized with regards to its anemia, it had stopped producing spherocytes and was stopped agglutinating, it had gone home and was doing quite well for a day or two when it collapsed outside suddenly in its back garden. Um, on necropsy, this is an enormous thick clot sitting in the pulmonary artery. It's kind of was the size of my thumb probably had been growing slowly over the disease process, um, duration about two weeks or so, um, and finally just dislodged and plugged up the pulmonary artery completely. Um, so just a, a very graphic reminder that IMHA patients are probably our most hypercoagulable um, patients that we see in clinical practice. Other times that we'll see hypercoagulability um, will be with DIC, um, Cushing's disease patients, although I think a lot of our Cushing's disease patients are very kind on us and don't tend to have um, complications with thrombosis very often. That's not the same for our protein losing nephropathy dogs who will often have um, blood clots um, as one of their complications of their disease process. We'll also see it in the PLE dogs, especially the little Yorkies that present with really severe lymphangiectasia. Um, a lot of them in a lot of um, clinical studies have been shown to die from clots rather than from their intestinal disease. Um, severe and chronic inflammatory disease, especially if we treat that severe chronic inflammatory disease with a whole ton of steroids, um, those patients are very much at risk of blood clots as well. And then of course neoplasia. And I know I haven't mentioned cats much in this whole talk and I do apologise for the feline practitioners. Um, cats are tricky to do coagulation studies on. They're hard to draw blood from, hard to keep in colonies, they're fussy. Um, and so there really isn't that much research when it comes to either hypercoagulability or hypocoagulability in cats. But we do know um, feline aortic thromboembolism is their special disease that um, really has to be treated with a lot of care. So just to quickly run through a very straightforward algorithm for a hypocoagulable dog. So this is a dog that comes in bleeding. Um, I have a flowchart, but I feel like that's more complicated than this. So I'm going to skip over that slide. I'm sorry. So basically, a patient comes in, it's anemic, it's bleeding. You're going to put, um, draw a little bit of blood for a PCV to run in-house um, just to see how anemic your patient is. With that extra uh, drop of blood, you make a blood smear and have a look under the microscope and do your platelet count. Look at, um, count 10 fields and see where it is. If it's obviously over 100,000, you're good. Thrombocytopenia is not playing a role in your pa patient's bleeding at all. If it's between around maybe, say, 40 to 80 or something like that, you're probably dealing with a consumptive situation. So you've had a lot of bleeding. Those platelets have tried to help out and they've just all been used up. If it's less than 10,000, then it's highly likely that the bleeding is being caused by your thrombocytopenia. There's going to be grey zones, clearly I haven't mentioned there, um, and so sometimes those are the times where you have to then go back and look at your patient a little bit more clinically and say, okay, does this look more like a thrombocytopenic patient with little petechiae and little tiny bruises on their gums, and, um, or does this look more like a, a uh, coagulopathy with a big br um, bleed into the abdomen or the chest? If you're lucky enough to have in-house machines that can run um, APTTs and PTs, that'll be your next step. Um, if you don't, you can always run an activated clotting time. Um, I 
remember running these in general practice and I found them a little bit tricky to run. I remember running around with them sort of stuffed down my bra to keep them nice and warm. Um, they can be a little bit fiddly, but they are a reasonably good test. If, it's, if your patient is bleeding and it's due to a deficiency in clotting factors, your ACT will be obviously prolonged. Um, even if it's, you know, you're not keeping it exactly the right temperature in the water bath and things like that. Draw a blood sample for an APTT or PT, even if you haven't got your in-house machine, before you do anything else with your patient, before you give it vitamin K, before you give it plasma, um, because drawing those samples after they've been given any treatments is going to make those um, results very, very difficult to um, interpret. I mentioned the PIVCA test here more just in case you'd heard of it. Uh, I don't really think anyone runs these very often. Um, it's proteins induced by vitamin K antagonism and it's a more specific test for rodenticide toxicity. I've never really felt the need to run that test. Some labs do offer it. And again, it's another sort of citrate tube that you could pull off and hold and send out to the lab if you were trying to confirm that your patient was a rodenticide toxicity. If your ACT is normal, your APTT are normal, the next thing you want, and your platelet count is normal, the next thing you want to do is a BMBT. And so you should have the little standardized um, little um, lancets to do your buccal mucosal bleeding time. Less than four minutes is normal. Make sure when you're doing your dabbing at the gums that you're not dislodging the clot and making your patient have a prolonged BMBT. Um, and um, most of the time, in a patient who does not have a platelet function disorder that, or von Willebrand's disease, that'll be well within that four minute um, cutoff. If the APTT and the PT are abnormal, you want to look at your patient and assess it for DIC, rodenticide, um, a fibrinogen deficiency. If all of these things are not playing a role in your patient, there's absolutely no possibility of access to rodenticide, then the next thing you're going to want to consider is measuring clotting factors. That can be done at commercial labs, Vetnostics, IDEX, or it can also be sent down to Melbourne University where they can run pretty much any clotting factor you ask them to run. If the BMBT is abnormal, then you need to rule out acquired platelet dysfunction. So look for a uremia or neoplasia, vasculitis, um, and then draw a sample also to send off for von Willebrand's testing, which they do at Melbourne University. Um, if it's negative for von Willebrand's disease, but you are 100% convinced that your patient has a platelet dysfunction, um, that's going to be one of those things where you then need to start calling the universities and speaking to their clinical pathology department and seeing if anyone can do platelet function testing for you. Um, you're really starting to deal with very rare, rare conditions at that point. And the difficulty, unfortunately, with platelet function testing is that the blood has to be tested almost immediately. So the dog needs to be at the, the research institution where they're doing the testing. So if you're faced with a patient who has potentially thrown a PTE or you've identified a blood clot on ultrasound or a thrombosis in a leg, a lot of the time what you're trying to work out is, first of all, is this really a PTE? Um, this dog has you know, acute onset dyspnea, seems to fit the picture of a, a, a PTE. Um, trying to confirm that it is a blood clot though actually can be quite difficult anti-mortem. Um, some of the tests that we can run are D-dimers, so basically these are um, the little fibrin, fibrin degradation products that are specific to clot formation um, of cross-linked fibrin. And D-dimers will be elevated very, very sensitively and specifically for um, pulmonary thromboembolism or PTE. So that's a test that, you can, that can help confirm that you are dealing with a thrombosis in your patient. The rest of these tests here are basically trying to look for underlying reasons as to why your patient may be prothrombotic. So measuring antithrombin um, can be performed, but before you want to do that, you may want to just do a simple urinalysis and look to see, is your po patient proteinuric? If it's pro proteinuric, then probably their antithrombin levels are low, um, and that's probably why your patient has a blood clot. Look for history of protein-losing enteropathy, steroid therapy. Um, an echo for um, evidence of endocarditis and then looking for chronic DIC triggers, for example, neoplasia. Thromboelastography is a fancy test that criticalists like. Um, it is a very fun, again, bedside tool for your patient. Your patient, your blood needs to be drawn immediately and processed straight away, where we can test um, all components of the coagulation system, so platelets, um, clotting factors, and fibrinolysis. It can show you 
a lot of the times where the defect exists, why your patient is hyper or hypocoagulable, um, and is uh, a very useful diagnostic tool if you have that in the facility in which you work. Um, the main problem is that most people don't have that available to them. Um, there are also a lot of uh, interassay variations and, and patient variations as well with the, the assay as well. So you'll probably hear about people talking about, oh, you need to use TEG um, to work up your patient. It's, it's a useful test, but you can certainly get around it and, and work out what's going on with your patient without that test. So, oh my God, it's 10 o'clock almost quickly getting to the point of actually treating your patient. The main part of treating most bleeding disorders is going to be with plasma. So fresh frozen plasma, which is a, a fast spin of whole blood into plasma, plasma and packed red blood cells um, and stored for immediately frozen and stored for less than one year. The dose that you're going to want to give is around six to 12 milligrams per kilo. And you're going to you may have to repeat that dose until you've repaired the underlying disorder. So um, it's going to take about 24 to 48 hours for the liver to start making new clotting factors, even once you start giving vitamin K. Uh, so you may potentially have to redose with fresh frozen plasma. And the same with the von Willebrand's deficiency dog. If it's bleeding after surgery, you may need to give a few more doses until they've been able to form their stable clots and they've hit, they're starting to heal. The other important thing on this slide, the middle part you can probably skip, but right down the bottom here is fresh whole blood. Everyone has access to fresh whole blood most of the time. Um, and it really is the ideal thing to treat a bleeding patient. It's going to give you the red cells they need, it's going to give you the clotting factors, and it's going to give you platelets that are going to be active for about 12 hours or so in that patient, as long as it's handled nicely. Um, it's really the only thing that will help a thrombocytopenic patient. Um, there is pretty much no other way that we can really get platelets to work in a patient any other way. So fresh whole blood is definitely a, a good way of treating a dog who is hemorrhaging. Caniplaz is the commercial fresh frozen plasma. How many of you guys have this in your freezers? It's probably worthwhile having a bag on hand. Um, it lasts for up to a year. Um, and it theoretically is um, fresh frozen plasma according to their website, although there aren't really any uh, non or independent studies that confirm active um, clotting factors. Um, Still having a bag of fresh frozen plasma on hand is certainly very handy um, if you have a bleeding patient coming in the door. And it's also very useful if you want to then go and do surgery on a patient who may have a pre-existing coagulation problem. So the other things that you can do is for von Willebrand's disease, you can use desmopressin or DDAVP. And so desmopressin releases any von Willebrand's factor that might be stored in those viable pallid bodies in the endothelium and just kind of pushes the body to produce as much of von Willebrand's factor as it possibly can just prior to surgery. Probably only raises the levels by about 20%. So for some dogs who are really severely deficient, it's not going to make that much of a difference. But for some dogs who are kind of on the edge, um, they may go from being a dog who was going to bleed with surgery to being a dog who doesn't bleed. Um, Ideally, you're going to be also having plasma on hand to treat them. If you're lucky to have cryoprecipitate, that's an even better product. But unfortunately, I didn't modify this, um, this presentation. I'm sorry for the blood products that we have available in Sydney and cryo. I don't think is available in Sydney. For greyhounds, this is the protocol that was devised at the Ohio State University. It's aminocaproic acid tablets, 500 milligrams um, once every eight hours for five days starting the, uh, the morning of surgery. And that has been shown to significantly reduce um, post-operative bleeding. I've also used aminocaproic acid in a lot of patients who are bleeding for other, dis for other reasons where we can't stop the bleeding in any other way. And it does seem to help stabilize the clots that are there. It's a fibrinolysis inhibitor and basically takes the clots that are already being formed and keeps them hanging around for a little bit longer. One of those if you're desperate type of drugs. For platelet deficiency, as I said, fresh whole blood is probably one of the best things that you can give. Um, these things would be nice if we had them available, um, but we, we may have fly off lies platelets available in the future, and that's basically kind of dry, frozen platelets that you can keep stored on your shelf. Um, they would be ideal for our patients if we can. In cases of desperation, I've been known to give barium orally um, to try and stop GI bleeding. It actually coats the gastrointestinal tract very nicely and stops bleeding for about 12 hours or so and buys you a little bit of time to pump some more blood into them. So 
I'm going to try to cover the prevention of thrombosis really quickly in five minutes if I can. I do apologize for lack of time. When it comes to prevention of thrombosis, there's really two, uh, two branches, either using heparins or the platelet inhibitors, so aspirin and clopidogrel. A lot of people have heparin on their shelf, unfractionated heparin, and the, now most people are starting to use more of the low molecular weight heparins as well. And the real difference between unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin is that unfractionated heparin is a mixture of larger and smaller molecules, and so it can inactivate factor 10 and factor 2 whereas the low molecular weight heparins can only inactivate factor 10. And so if you use low molecular weight heparin in your patient, it will not prolong the APTT at all. It'll make your patient more likely to bleed or prevent thrombosis, but it will not be measurable on any of the normal clotting factor tests that we have in, um, available. There's two types of low molecular weight heparins, um, enoxaparin and deltaparin. They are not equivalent in any way. They're dosed very differently. One's 0.8 milligrams per kilo every six hours sub-Q. The other one's 150 units per kilo every eight hours sub-Q. Um, the trade of enoxaparin is clexane and deltaparin is fragmin. Um, these have been shown to be safe in dogs who are known to be hypercoagulable. So cases like IMHA or a sepsis or SERS case where you're no, or a case where you've already got DIC um, or pulmonary thromboembolism. And I have switched to using the low molecular weight heparins over unfractionated heparin because monitoring unfractionated heparin in dogs is, a, is difficult and complicated and not particularly successful most of the time. Our only problem with these drugs is that they're really, really expensive. So for something cheaper, um, a lot of people will use aspirin or clopidogrel. Um, they're both relatively safe in our patients. At this low dose of 0.5 mg per gig of aspirin, we don't tend to see much in the way of GI side effects, and you can combine that with corticosteroids um, in your IMHA patients. I prefer clopidogrel if I feel like the patient has some pre-existing GI disease. Um, Clopidogrel possibly also has more reliable absorption of pharmacokinetics than aspirin though, but overall they're both um, relatively cheap, easy, probably effective drugs and probably safe drugs to use in our patients as well. In cats, the majority of the problem is that we don't know when to start preventing thrombus formation. Um, whether you do it when you first see a cat diagnosed with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or if you wait until you see, see smoke in their left atrium or wait until they actually form a clot. The protocols for prevention are either aspirin at 81 milligrams every three days or five milligrams once daily, or clopidogrel around a quarter of a tablet once daily. Um, but none of these have really been shown to make a significant out difference in outcome of, of cats. Um, and include, there's a really big study for, with clopidogrel that really still hasn't been shown to um, make a difference. So it's one of those things where you have to discuss it with your client as to whether or not you want to do this um, and why. If you do have a cat with a thrombus, this is my inpatient treatment, either fragment or anoxaparin, I'm sorry, not both, um, a sub-Q therapy to try to, you know, this is not going to dissolve the clot, this is going to try to stop the clot from getting bigger and let the cat break the clot down gradually over time and develop collateral circulation. And then usually once they're doing better, I then start them on something oral to go home. Um, so this is Josie. She is a one-year-old Labrador who presented to me on ER. Um, acute onset weakness and dyspnea. On physical exam, she had dull lung sounds and uh, weak pulses. A, she also looked pretty pale as well, so we quickly pulled blood for a PCV and saw that it was 39, but total, which is normal, but total solids were low at uh, 32. And that discrepancy in PCV and total solids is pretty classic for an acute bleed where they haven't had time to equilibrate their hematocrit yet, but they've already lost their plasma proteins. Um, an in-house, whoops, sorry, an in-house PT was greater than 100, and AP, which is greatly, greatly prolonged, and APTT was moderately prolonged at 206. And a quick thoracic ultrasound showed pleural effusion. So we did a very little tiny, tiny needle um, diagnostic tap and got frank blood and went and told the owner it's probably going to be hemothorax secondary to rodenticide. Couldn't rule out hemothorax because of neoplasia or um, um, a rotor blood vessel from um, a parasite or something like that instead. <laughs> 
The very first thing we did was to try to stabilise the dog's breathing and so a thoracocentesis to remove some of the pleural effusion so that she could breathe a little bit better. We collected it into the little blood collection bags um, and then pumped it straight back into her um, using a little blood filter over about 15 minutes and that made her feel a lot better. While we were doing that, we thawed our bag of plasma that we had in the freezer and then once that was thawed, we got that into her, uh, started that running. I am a pretty conservative person, so I, the dog was doing better at that point, so I waited for the clotting factors to be on board after about an hour before I went and sh put more sharp needles into her chest. Um, and once I felt that was on board, we then gave her um, a, a much more effective thoracocentesis, took another 400 mils off and order transfused that as well. Um, three hours after fresh frozen plasma, her PCV was definitely low at this point, um, but her clotting times had pretty much normalised. And by the next day, she just sort of sat in a cage um, overnight. And by the next day, she was back to being a rambunctious Labrador again without any further problems. She went home on her vitamin K. Um, and the important thing to notice is even though this was an acute sort of emergency type situation, we still dosed orally for a vitamin K. Oral absorption of vitamin K is just as good as sub-Q or IM, and it won't cause a hematoma. Um, IV administration of um, vitamin K can cause anaphylaxis, so that shouldn't ever be done. Um, so Penguin is a three-year-old Boston Terrier who presented to me. He'd been diagnosed with IMHA a couple of days prior and started on two mg per kg prednisone BID, so a pretty high dose of steroids. Um, he was inappetent, he was tiring on walks and lethargic and dyspneic. Uh, CBC showed that he had agglutination, spherocytes and regenerative anemia and a mild thrombocytopenia. So that 50,000 thrombocytopenia is fairly typical in IMHA cases. That's that consumptive coagulopathy that we're seeing there. Luckily for him, his APTT and PT were within normal limits, so he didn't have full-blown DIC from his IMHA. Um, and we ran tick titers because we were in California, um, and they were all negative. Chest radiographs to investigate the cause of his dyspnea um, showed mild pleural effusion. And this is something that we saw really commonly in our IMHA cases. And we theorized and we saw on necropsy that a lot of these dogs have microthrombi throughout their vasculature and that causes the pleural effusion in their chest. It can also cause a slight abdominal effusion as well. The other thing is that often they'll get these very small microthrombi affecting the vasculature of the gut as well. And that often causes them to be feeling you know, pretty crappy, have GI symptoms. Um, uh, with their IMHA. So the first thing we did was drop the steroid dose down by half to one mg per kg BID and that's probably my top dose for IMHA. I don't feel like going much higher than that helps them really. Um, we added on mycophenolate as our other immunosuppressive um, at a quarter of a tablet twice daily and that worked out to be around 10 milligrams per kilo twice daily. We transfused him with some packed red blood cells we started him on some gas inhibitants because uh, GI bleeding is a common cause of inappetence in IMHA dogs as well. And then we looked into what we could do for thromboprophylaxis. So because he wasn't eating, we, had, we couldn't really give him Plavix or aspirin. And so we used uh, Clexane at um, 0.8 mg per kg every six hours. Once he was eating and feeling better, we started him on Clopidogrel. And the pleural effusion resolved without any further treatment, which was nice. We weaned the anoxaparin over three to four days in hospital, and I kept him on the clopidogrel until the prednisone was less than 0.5 mg per kg per day. Um, that may seem excessive. It's gone on for certainly, you know, patients will be on steroids for a very long time until they get down to that dose. Um, but based on what I've seen in the past of dogs presenting with thrombi, not because of their IMHA, but because of their steroid therapy, it's what I do. To, I feel like it's a pretty safe treatment um, to prevent thrombosis in these dogs. And he did really, really, really well. He gained a ton of weight um, and ended up looking like a much more like a penguin shape. Um, but he did very well. So this is an amazing resource that I want you guys to all write down. Um, it's by Cornell University's Clinical Pathology Lab. It's a website that you can access on your phone or on your computer. Um, it's pretty much got answers to any clinical pathology question you may have, whether it's cytology or hematology, biochemistry. Um, it runs through all the individual tests, how they work, um, and kind of what to do next if that test is abnormal. So I have no financial link to the website, um, but I think it's a really, really wonderful resource that um, they've 
gone and put up there for the greater good. And this is also the contact number of Deborah Kirkham at Melbourne University Veterinary Sciences um, Clinical Pathology Lab, and they run all the clotting factor assays. So you can just call them and sort of say, hey, I've got a case where my APTT is prolonged, my PT is normal, the dog came in, you know, bleeding after surgery, I think it might be a haemophiliac, can I run factor eight testing or factor nine testing? And they can work through the case with you as well. Thank you very much for staying up so very late. <laughs>